Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ARCHICAD User Monthly Webinar for September 2020. My name is Eric Barbaro, and I'm speaking to you from San Rafael, California, where finally, after weeks of smoke um, from huge California fires and some in Oregon, um, we have blue skies. Um, hope it lasts for a while. Welcome, Rich Matthews, uh, where it's down under. It's really early, like six in the morning. How are you doing? Oh, well, good. Thank you very much. Good day to everyone. So uh, let us know that you can hear us and see us. See our Use the go to a webinar chat panel and type in uh, your name and where you're calling in from. It's always fun to, to see that. So uh, I see Glenn from Auckland. All right. Connor from Ireland. Rich from Bermuda. Don from Omaha. Henry from Alberta. So even in the first five, we had five different countries. That's great. And Dominican Republic. Uh, all right. So and we've got 70 plus people and more, more coming in. So uh, and May from Boston and Sidley from St. Vincent. I think that's a, that's a, one of the Caribbean, if I'm not mistaken, and Raul from Chile. So we actually cover both of the Americas in terms of continents. And we've got... Um, uh, we have Ireland, so we have uh, Europe, and of course, down under, both Australia and uh, New Zealand. Okay, and hey, Stuart from Melbourne. All right, so let's get going. Um, so, uh, Rich, you and I have known each other for a while. Um, you're one of the uh, few people still standing, so to speak, who uh, started with Arcad before I did. I started in 1989, and you said that you recalled it was like 1988. So, That's uh, you know, I, I respect you as my elder and uh, all of that. Um, anyway, uh, so over the years, we've had, you know, contact in different ways. And, you know, you've been involved in my training programs and you presented at the Masters of Archicad Summit a few years ago. One of your very interesting projects, sort of an exotic one from uh, an Indian palace. Um, by the way, did that get fully constructed? Because I'm not sure if you were just... Yeah, uh, well. It's not fully constructed to my um, uh, way of thinking because there's a few missing little pieces that I think would finish it off. But no, they've uh, they've essentially finished and uh, they've, it's now a a B and B with a six star. Uh, the, the what used to be the granny flat has now been converted into a six star unit, and what used to be the uh, the theater and the entertainment room is now a five star. Well, maybe even a six star B and B as well. So yeah, no, it's it's looking fantastic. It's uh, Instagram. It's called um, Joe Dubai Retreat. So anybody wants to look that up on Instagram. How do you spell that? Uh, J O D H A I. Joe Dubai B A I Retreat. Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll uh, have to check that out. So um, <clears throat> you've been using Arcad for a very long time. We're going to focus today on your methodology. We'll take a look at some of your uh, projects, and I want to just point out to everyone who's involved here that um, you know Rich is an expert. He's a master. In fact, I know in your background you were actually helping to train Archicad users back in the 90s um, in Australia. You were uh, working in support for the reseller or the distributor at that time, um, and yet, Rich. You uh, enrolled in a course earlier this year, the VR for Architects course, so that you can learn more about Twin Motion. That's a course that I produced and that Peter Tui, um, architect, uh, taught. Um, yep. We had a session last week when we were making arrangements for this where you had a, a little confusion about um, what was the best way to deal with uh, your uh, Project Zero level in relationship to AHD or C level. And we went over that. And you know, I know that you have uh, now absorbed like okay so that i can do it differently so this is important for all of you this is a lifelong learning you know the oh, software absolutely yeah? Yep. yeah yeah the software changes and even even if the software didn't change it's the fact that your understanding allows you to take advantage of things over time in different ways um uh, you know and just uh, really um evolve your practice so Congratulations, and uh, you know I'm so pleased to be continue to work with you and 
now you can share your work. So tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into Archicad, um, what type of work you focus on, and then we'll dig into the actual projects. All righty. Um, well, one of the things I want to say is that um, I actually, this all started off by me contacting uh, Eric and saying, look, I think, you know, I was doing something today with schedules. Maybe I could do a 15 minute session on your next users meeting. Uh, and that, you know, that dug myself a hole. Next thing you know, I'm doing a whole two hours. So um, <laughs> wasn't watch, the out, watch out if you talk to me like that. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't the intention. I'm just going to turn these cameras off for the moment. Um, which is, by the way, I don't know whether people do this or not, but that's how I do it. I have a no camera setting because I hate those extra lines all over the page of the cameras, which are normally, um, and uh, why I've got those, uh, I'll just do another little change here. It's amazing when you set these things up. Um, how, where are we? Doesn't matter, look. You can, um, you can select this the section markers uh and just write well I'll just yeah i'll just but but look it, it'll come back on anyways i had a special uh in fact i'll do that now i'll just show you what i did i grabbed all of those these are all of my can everybody see my view map on the left hand side sorry i've got a large screen so you may be small for some people i can zoom in if you're necessary but these are my webinar notes that i've set up as special stories and what I'm going to do now is go into my settings. And I'm going to change this back to what I had it initially, which is which is the webinar notes. So that's the layer combination. That'll switch those things off. Do do what I intended initially. Okay. Um, so another idea. Who didn't follow, uh, Rich just updated a number of different views that he's already set up. They were using a different layer combination than was ideal. It was showing those uh, uh, section markers. And so we updated all of them at once, just the one change, which so is- I, I grabbed all of these at once and I was able to go in and, well, you can do that with a, with layers, with scale, um, a number of things that you that um, uh, okay. is very handy. Yeah, all right. So you've got a little introduction there. You dug yourself okay. in. So you, everybody should have read this in the introduction anyway. So uh, I just want to emphasize that I do try to be as BIM clean as possible, meaning that I try not to put any 2D lines in there. Notes are something which you pretty well have to do. But although that's where, I, you know, uh, Eric says I'm an expert. I'm far from that these days because so many things change. So many things I don't have any use for. I don't use MEP. I don't, you know, there's a m bunch of things because of my practice. I tend not, although, you know, you never know, I might come across a project where that would be required. Uh, I have done some um, some fairly large warehouse jobs in the past, but of course, Archicad didn't have those features then. So if if there is something that comes up in a project, then I'll take a look and start using it, just like I've decided to start using um, Twin Motion. Um, but um, yeah, so. I'll now just go and I'll just briefly talk. Some people are obviously usually interested if I can get this to work. Uh, my workstations, I'm fairly well set up. I have a Mac, an older Mac Pro 2013, uh, which was, you know, the uh, U-Boot machine at the time, but now it's uh, seven years old. I've got three backup drives. I'm pretty cautious about backing up and plus um, uh, cloud backup. I, use a 32 inch cinema display quite an old one but still a beauty and a 27 inch my older iMac as an extra screen for that and that also gives me an extra backup machine should something happen because i wanted to get into twin motion i found that because my mac is seven years old its graphic cards weren't good enough to or wouldn't run twin motion uh, too many crashes all the time so i then decided to go out and buy a custom pc and uh, that is working very well a little bit still learning how to use windows a bit better but that's going well one thing i'd like to mention to people is a thing called share mouse so i can use one mouse one keyboard i can go slide across to the mac here on my left hand side i can go to all four screens and no matter which screen I'm on with the cursor, I can then use the volume controls just like I would normally do with 
my Mac. Um, I can I can actually drag and drop from one one computer to the other, so it's and copy and paste text. So anybody who has a laptop and a home and office computer um, might want to check share mouse out. I don't have shares, <laughs> so but uh, yeah. So it can work it can go work Mac to Mac, PC to PC, or Mac yeah. to PC. Exactly. Two two um, you can have up to four screens, two computers. So awesome. It, it's it's really and, and the other thing that was uh, I was able to do through that was to change my uh, the PC control key to the command key, which of course then, you know, because it's one of the difficulties of switching from Mac to PC is you're, you're always dealing, if you're used to using key shortcuts, it's always a pain in the butt to, to have to, you know, get used to switching between the control and, and uh, the command key on the Mac. And so now I can just use the command key as I would normally. So that has saved me a lot of grief. Um, okay. Now you, you mentioned something about your iPad and what was this about splash top? So what were... Oh, I see. Yes, um, I have a 12.9 uh, inch iPad Pro, and I use that a fair amount to show. You know, if I go out to clients, uh, to either one show them demonstrate projects I've done in the past. If I'm trying to get the work, and also going out and speak to them about their project, I can use the the, the iPad to go through the BIMX or the or the um, PDF, whatever it is I want to speak about. I can also use that though, as uh, on if I go away for a weekend or a holiday, I can take my iMac Pro with me and using a thing called Splash Top, which is one of the remote um, access uh, uh, apps, I can, I'll leave my Mac on and I can access the Mac and I could work on it, but because it's such a large screen, and uh, you know it's a little bit difficult to actually do any work but that's not the reason you go away on holidays anyway so but at least it allows me to i've many times i've had a client phone up and say you know can you do whatever and i'm able to you know either send a file off to a engineer or whatever it is so that the ipad pro really works well uh for me as a as a distant uh, so access to my, my office splash top allows you to see and control the remote mac Yep, you just simply um, you just simply um, click on the splash top. It opens up the computer. You have to do the all your um, passwords and stuff to get in. But once you're in, you can then use the the um, you know just use your finger as a as your mouse. Um, and like I said, because the large screen, I often have to zoom in a bit. But no, it's pretty it's pretty accessible. You know, you can you can really do. I wouldn't want to try to do an ARCHICAD project on it, but. <laughs> But uh, other than that, it's very useful. And it goes directly from iOS to the Mac as opposed to one Mac to another Mac? Um, because you mentioned taking your iMac uh, sometimes. No, no, no. Well, no, I haven't. Uh, look, there have been occasions when, for instance, for this Palace um, project where I've taken my, well, actually, then it was the iMac Pro because that's a little, little easier to pack and borrowed their screen, and I'd go up there and do some work while I was up there. So. You know the the iMac Pro is just a little cylinder thing, so it's easy to stick into a, into a um, suitcase. Getting it through the airport sometimes a bit more fun, but still, um, yeah. So the iMac is is really just like I said, a backup. It's a, a great second monitor, 27 inch monitor, and it um, but it also does give me the opportunity should something happen to well, previously, it's happened to the to the uh, to the, uh, I, the Mac Pro. I have a second backup computer as well, so I tend not to throw away old equipment. I've actually even got an old um, uh, Mac Pro 2009, uh, which actually serves as a server. It's got four drives in it, so it also gives me that opportunity. So yes, yeah, so I've always believed in I, I, when I used to sell Archicad and and um, support it. I'd go out to an architect, and he's got a Porsche parked out the front but is used to, in those days it was an old door and you know slide rule and and he would complain about spending thirteen thousand dollars on a computer equipment and I'm thinking <laughs> you know if you got a hole to dig get the best tool to dig the hole with so I could never quite figure out their objections to spending money on a, on equipment that would really get their job done better so I've always believed in large screens uh, easy to I can have PDFs open on 
on a side screen. I can uh, I actually even have a TV tuner. If I really want to get lazy, I can watch a bit of TV as I'm or listen to a, something as I'm working. Uh, it's not the most efficient way to work, but still. Um, okay. The other thing I thought I'd just briefly cover is how I prepare for every project. The work environment. Uh, I always, if I get a new version of Archicad, I always start from scratch to set up that that uh, new work environment because you don't want to miss out on some of the new tools. So there's a fair amount of modification. If you take a look up here at my, get rid of that for the moment. Um, you, you can see that. Uh, well, hang on. Let me go to. Um, I have a, even though it's a big screen, I still have a fairly short um, toolbar uh, because I've vetted most of the stuff that I don't use. I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts, so I don't really need to have um, a lot of things to go up to, to to click on. So what you see up here is basically what I might use uh, and nothing more. I've also changed things in the info box. One of the things I like to have. Um, if I go to say for a Windows, I like to have the the. This is normally way off to the side somewhere because I like to have it on the top of the screen, not down, like I see some people. But I like to have the ID up here because it makes it very easy to select a door or window and and stick the uh, ID up here. I'll, I'll demonstrate that maybe as we get into that. Um, as far as templates go, um, I've been tempted to buy. Eric's template, but it seems to me like a be a lot of change, a lot of work, and you know uh, I seem to have enough time, hard enough time trying to find time to do my work, let alone experiment, etc. So I'm quite happy with how I do things. What I normally do is take the last project that I've been working on, which is you know sort of a development from whatever's happened before. I may look at the projects and say this is better suited, but I'll take the last project. I'll turn off all the layers. So for instance, if I was to go to um, this, I would I would go here, I would turn on all the layers, uh, except I would either lock or turn off the section and elevation markers. And I would then, um, and, and the cameras, and then I would do a marquee, delete everything. And when I start my new project, I'll, I'll have the the uh, elevation and section markers on the a blank plan. Uh, I would then start my new project, which is basically next to the zero zero um, as far as the coordinates go, and I start building around essentially the same spot, so that when anytime I do another 3D uh, or a, a, a layout, it's going to show up in the layout sheet exactly where the last uh, project showed up and I just have to do a bit of adjusting. I don't have to go in and reset all my my um, layout book items, right? So the uh, so um, my layering system. Um, I, I I'll show you in a second. I sort by numbers. I like to use easy to understand naming. I, I'm sometimes really frustrated when they get DWGs and there's X, Y, Z and P, double P, and I, you know you never know what they really mean. So what I've done for the longest time, I started this very early in the piece. I'll just zoom in a bit. Maybe that will help. Can everybody see that? Is that all right for you, Eric? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean it's. Uh... It's a little bit pixelated, but I think it's good enough. So if you just point and say things. Oh, okay. and can... So for instance, you'll notice here I've got I've got zero zero zero. So this is how I sort my by layer name. All of my zeros are walls. So it could be a road curb, it could be a retaining wall, it could be removed walls, etc. And even in this case, gutters because I use uh, a complex profile as my gutter. So, but it's it's I use the wall tool to do that. I could use a beam tool. Sometimes use the beam tool because then you can uh, angle the gutter. But in this case, any gutters are made of walls. So if I'm looking for my gutters, I mean, pretty well always it's a wall, but I might have to look and just check and see if it's a beam. Uh, but that's where it is at the moment for this. There's a pergola beam, structural beams, structural columns are ones. 
Um, two is all slabs. Now it's a redundant system and that I also could sort by extension, but it would give me basically the same sorting. But uh, so all the objects are, are zero fours. So again, if I know it's an object, I don't have to sort of search through and look for various different areas. If I can go straight to zero four, or if I want to new, name a new one, I know it's going to be a zero four. So it could be anything exposed rafters, fences, bedroom furniture, all that sort of thing that, that are objects, plumbing, vehicles. Roofs are all 05s, 06 are terrain, 07 is text. Now up to 06 is all the 3D stuff, which is another thing that makes it a little easier to, to turn on and turn off stuff if I need to. Um, uh, all the, all the two-dimensional are below that. So to some degree, this was set up by the order of the what was then the, the toolbox. Um, so so walls were first etc slabs so that's how it was set up initially but and uh, and that's why that sort of the numbering system is it as it is um and it, to some degree it also works um i've often thought that that archicad's initial um, way of sorting was often the walls were always at the bottom of the list so you had to scroll down to get to a wall right so that was a frustration for me which is another reason why walls are zero zero but it makes sense to me because that's often what you're initially inputting into the model. So that's that's essentially the the way of sorting through all the, the lesser used items are down at the bottom. Um, I have things like my title block and, and any library constructions uh, are at the very last because you don't use those very often, but if I'm trying to create windows, doors, objects, whatever it is, I, I do those in a special layer down here. As far as the layer combinations go, um, that again is basically try i try to order that by a number system so zero zero are more to do with roof and site plans um oh one are, are essentially floor plans this the sort of standard floor plans but then if i have more things that i'm not using quite as often uh, electrical plans erosion and, and sediment control those are all the then the the um Four plan combinations that I use, and those are pretty standard throughout most of my my uh, projects. You notice I've got a twin motion uh, one in here now because when you import to twin motion, um, you basically want to be able to shut off specific um, items on occasion. But you may use furniture initially, but Twin motions furniture is better, so you'd want to switch that off in ARCHICAD when you do a direct import, which is very quick and easy to do. You can be working in twin motion, adding a bunch of stuff. You go back to ARCHICAD to change something, and when you come back, all everything that you've added in, Arch in twin motion is there. It's just a direct thing, and it happens very quickly with the sink. I might show you that later. Um, yeah, so. Um, down at the bottom, of course, is your show and unlock. Uh, etc. Uh, layers. So, okay. Thank you for for showing us all of that. It's a very different system than what I'm used to, but it it certainly yeah. Has, well, has a, have, sorry. Uh, it has sorry. a discipline. It has a discipline and a clarity that I admire. Thank you. Um, stories. Um, I uh, I adjust the story dialogue to suit obviously the new site levels when you first go in. Um, I also use extra stories. I'll just see whether people uh, are familiar with doing that. Um, so for instance, whoops, what happened there? I, um, I have ground floor. I then have a deck roof lining, a ground floor level ceiling, um, and a lower roof before I get to the upper floor. So I don't just stack, you know, the stories one above the other. Now, the disadvantage of that is that if you're trying to show a stair, for instance, on one floor and one another floor above that, um, it, as ARCHICAD likes to do, it doesn't seem to give you the options as much as I'd like to see where, where you can do, go into a custom and say you want to see it on three stories up or, or not. I don't know why they don't do it that for everything like they do for some items. 
but so that's a disadvantage of this system. But what it allows me to do is to put in special, uh, hang on, I'll just go to that. Um, so for instance, if I go to the, to the um, uh, deck roof lining, that's all that's there. These are, these are um, roof um, angled uh, ceiling linings between the beams and the front wall. So if I was to turn on the, the um, there's the, the trace, if you can see that. Um, this back is a single story and that's got that sloping roof that you saw in the, in the 3D. So that's what we're looking at here. So I'm looking at this ceiling lining in here. And, uh, and that allows me to, to play with that and not get too, you know, because for instance, if I go to the next story up, these are the battens. Now, unless somebody can tell me, I can't figure out how to make that batten background, um, uh, you know, turn it off, make it, in, make it uh, what do you call it? Anyways, um, I would love to be able to do that because as you could see, I did have, I do have rafters under that as well. So I'd have to go in and turn off this layer to work on my rafters, etc. So have to me, the by putting using the display order to to send the those larger ob objects uh, to the back of the display order. I could, I could just simply do that, I suppose. But if I forget, uh, well, I suppose it. If it doesn't affect anything in 3D, just right click and say. Oh, that's that's true. So I could easily do that. Yes, it's true. Um. um now I have also have in here, those are, oh, it's a separate set of battens. So I'd have to switch them all off. Um, and yes, I suppose that would work for almost all of that roof. I can still work with all of the things with, with um, uh, that, that, that set of battens, of course, is for the ceiling lining. Um, that's why they're there. So. Okay. So you're 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 using stories in a way that um, isolates <clears throat> certain elements uh, for your use for modeling and for getting certain drawings done. Um, this is something that uh, perhaps I can spend a little time with you separately uh, to look at that and see about layer combinations because I think that um, well anyway there are things that that uh, even as you explain this I'll, I'll mention one limitation that has gone away in ARCHICAD 21 and above, and that is that stairs, for example, you were mentioning, hey, if I'm spanning it from one story to another story and passing through some interstitial stories that are yes. not really floors um, there, well, you can now um, have a setting in the stair tool that says, how do I want to show it on um, relevant stories, so it won't show below where it starts, and it won't show above the story where it ends, for example. And uh, you can then say that on the top story, I want it to look this way, and on the bottom story, a different way. Now, in between, you would just ha you just have your views with that layer turned off. Um, so that would that would be, you know, just ne necessary if you're going to be having views that show framing of the ceiling, and you don't want to show the um, the stair. Of course, there's studying interactions like making sure the head height is correct or things. You could manually turn those layers on. But this yeah. is something that changed in version 21 because you can have stairs spanning multiple stories. Yeah. Well, I thought I'd, I'd tried that, Eric, that relevant stories, I could never figure out why it was there because it never seemed to work the way it's, I thought it should work. So that's something I'll have another close look at. But I've, I've looked at that many times. And, and to me, relevant stories, it seemed to show in everything. But I, I, I guess maybe... Uh, yes, you could control it by layering um, combinations, turn the stair off on those certain other stories. So, so sure. Um, well, you, you certainly have a, a method that's working for you. So far be it yeah. from me to say you have to change, but perhaps there are some things that, you know, can simplify. One of the things, for instance, is that, and yes, I suppose, again, one could control it through, but um, if I go to my ground floor, Um, often when you're trying to pick things, if you have a slab in there as well, you pick up the slab and, you know, it's a pain. So that's another reason why then I have my, my floor slabs on a, on a, um, different level and, you know, it allows me to, to trace 
where is my floor slab here allows me to trace whatever I want to do um, and um, yeah, make those changes but but that's that's how I do it now having this is you know it's always good to be going through an exercise like this because it's a good learning tool for me as well one of the things I was thinking about with that is that I could actually place those extra levels uh, above even though they, they those stories occur below the upper floor I could still essentially pl uh, place them above and still end up with the correct RLs for those particular items if I wanted to do it that way but I'll, I'll, I'll take it in what you said Eric and think about how I could also do it by layering it, it works for me now and you know I'm pretty happy with how that that does work um, um yes. by the way there's a, a couple of suggestions of some alternate suggestions for dealing with that uh you know where you couldn't see the um the battens uh, i guess um uh, or the um framing there so one was talking about uh suddenly suggested transparent you know is there an option for that particular um, well that's what i was saying i couldn't find a transparent for that particular um uh so so that's the lining there's a ceiling. Um, whoops. Where did I? Oh, I must have missed the floor. Yes, no, I've. Yes, no, if you select uh, that, um, there is no. I've the cut I've cut fill background is transparent, but there's no even in the dialog box itself, I've not been able to find. Okay. All right. Um there's also a graphic override is a possibility that could be done where you force the back background for um elements on a particular layer or a particular type. Um so that's at least something to is this is this going to make a, a fool of me by by doing this? Hang on, I'll just change this too while I'm at it. Oh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm glad to, that you're willing to play along. There you go. There you go. It, it obviously didn't look hard enough because I was surprised, but there it is. It, there there is a there is a um, a tool for it. And why I missed that, I have no idea, but it's right there. So it does, which, like I said, it surprised me. I couldn't do that. But then I found that with a bunch, bunch of things lately. I think, oh, it isn't working, and I'll go back to it later and find that it does. So, okay. so awesome. um, um, can we look at the project as a whole? You're, you know, we're getting into the yeah, all right, okay, yeah, we're getting into the details when we haven't even seen, for example, this project, and just um, I always like starting with understanding the project architecturally. Tell us a little bit about this building and, and the site and then a little bit let's look at the model and cut through it and just see how you model things so that's i think a good, right. good time. okay so so this was this is a current project it just i just stuck it in for the development application um into council yesterday uh, a very a very um fussy client i must say one of my well i would say the fussiest everything had to line up everything had to be just so uh, a little bit too early in the piece for my liking, of course, because, you know, as, as with everything, models develop and I throw in a window. I don't necessarily say it's, that's the final window and that's what she wanted to see all the time. But that's all right. You know, keeps you on your toes. Um, so it's basically, I think, much too large uh, of a, it's a young couple. He's a carpenter and they're going to do the uh, owner builder situation. But in my opinion, the, there's a, they could have reduced the cost by, I think, 25% by just making rooms a bit smaller. You know, if you look at the width of this this hallway, if we go up to the upper floor, for some reason this mouse, it seems to be, my double clicking doesn't seem to be working very well. Um, I'll turn off the, um, Yes, very, very large bedrooms and, and you know, wasted space. So if it was just me designing it, I would have done it differently, but she was very insistent. So clients always write, in my opinion, they, you know, what they want. So, but I think they're going to find the cost could be a blowout on this, uh, despite the fact they're going to be owner builders. Um, so the, the essentially, that's the upper floor. I'll just go through the, 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 the stories, essentially. 
So we had our ground floor. I then go up and I have that lining for the ceiling. There's all the structural uh, uh, rafters and battens, etc. That's the lower roof and the roof over the shed off the side. So I can show that um, separately. Um, I could have had that on this upper floor. Um, why didn't I do that? Uh, look, again, it's a system which I've become accustomed to. I'll show you what happens later. There are the, the, uh, the um, trusses along here um, and the uh, main roof. So the so there's the the uh, the, the the 3D model. Um, what was so I there's a do? question about the site. How do you bring in the site when you do import it from Google? Do you do it by hand? Um, no, I, 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 I always get the uh, DWG uh, contoured. Uh, well, almost always from a from a surveyor. We need to have the surveys turned into the council anyway, so I get them to make sure they've got a contoured site. Um, I then go in. And for instance, you might notice here. I thought I'd corrected this. I must have got a different file. Anyways, you can see there's some patches here. So what I've done to get clearance for the timber, which you have to have a 400 mil minimum clearance here to any under under any timber floor, I actually put in a. a an SEO, which should be this one. So that's a cutting um, slab that's formed around the, the, the building, but underneath the building where I need to have it, you can see it coming out through here. So that then I use the SEO to cut out the, to get the space underneath instead of having to reform the actual mesh myself. Uh, but in addition to that, um, and you'll notice that by the way that I've got I, I usually cut, do these in red, so they're obvious. You know, in fact, you can see one inside here, which is cutting underside of a wall under, underneath a stair. Um, uh, but in this case, I've made the sides and the bottom grass, and then said, use the attribute of the SEO. So if I want to do a cut, um, I can say, use, sorry, I can say inherit from operator. So that if I hadn't done that, you would have seen the cut and you would have seen um, dirt. Uh, yes, correct. But this, this way now, I get I get to see when I turn that layer off. Um, I just get to see nice green grass. I I, I had corrected these. I'm not sure why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I kept all these open and then I shut my, I, I told my PC not to shut down overnight, but it did anyway, so I'm not sure why it did that. Uh, so I sort of lost my settings, I suppose. Um, anyway, so that's how I've done that. Um, I've had to reform some of this along here because this retaining wall is going to be more than a meter high. So I've had to actually physically go into the, to the, uh, my, what I call my terrain model. And I've added a bunch of points. There's points all around the driveway, around the path. In fact, you'll notice here there's quite a few points because this was the original orientation of the building with the with the driveway and the path. Whereas now the path is down here and the driveway is here. So we rotate. They she wanted the building rotated slightly. So I didn't bother re re doing those points. They they worked anyways basically. So. But I so I would have to go in and if I wanted to reduce, for instance, those those little peaks along the side, I can go in here and that's how I would do it. Just reform the the original um, landscape to to do that. So these these points do not appear to have contour lines connecting them. So you do them as a well, bunch of individual points. In actual fact, there are there are contour lines, but it's almost a flat site to begin with. So what you, they gave me this time was the all these other triangulation points. So those are the points I used initially instead of the contour mm -hmm. because there was more of them around the site. Um, well, they're also, the, they're also the precise sample points um, that, they, that they measured. The contour right. are estimated based on mathematical formulas, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So normally, normally I would only get the contour lines, so then I, would, I have a method um, which is commonly available on, on the help 
um, screen for ARCHICAD um, that tells you how to to import a large site and do all the all the contours and change them into into using that magic uh, wand to change them into the into contour lines and then those contour lines can be um, uh, copied basically onto the mesh and uh, you click on one line and all that say apply to wall and all that all that line then becomes one rl so that's okay. so, so in answer to the question from um i guess uh, that was raul uh, you're, you're bringing in 2d information in the form of the survey with the elevation uh, points and either point elevations or more frequently contour lines that you're going to rely on to build the mesh so you build the mesh manually from the data that's correct that's correct i have i have in this in a case like this one oh no this is a little bit different because i've changed it but the initial um ground in this one was a, a direct 3d um uh object that i got from the i'm trying to remember how i did that but the 3d object that i got from uh, the uh, engineers but the trouble with that was i couldn't really modify it i couldn't you know i couldn't do any seos for these big these this is a great big slabs of sandstone in this in this site and i so i couldn't model it so just recently it, i i actually went in and and um, formed a, a terrain that that matched that initial skin because it was only just a skin um and uh, and so that that meant they had to do a lot more uh in in sections i had to do a lot of fills in my in my um so if i was to do a so what now i can use just the natural um fill for my terrain before i had to do all of these fills and cut around things using a uh, at least that's my method of using a um, uh, a, a fill, a, an earth fill, and so I had to cut that in. If I made a change to the model, I had to go back in and make sure I changed the fills, which is why BIM is so useful. So it was, it was convenient to bring in that object at the beginning because you could do design based on, you know, just the slope and and elevation points. But then after a while, it became more of a nuisance because you didn't have a, a native element inside Archicad. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Okay. Like I said, all these all these rocks were just just a hump. They were a different color by uh, in the in the model, but like I said, I couldn't um, I couldn't SEO uh, anything. You know, all this structure below the ground level was hanging down in midair, etc. So I had to somehow cover that or or do something. So this this has made it much more. And I think I also did this because I was I've also taken this into Twin Motion to do a a twin motion version of it so it was very useful i guess just some one thing while i'm you know there's a good example of of two scale um uh complex profiles this is, this is a, a, a engineers i got these from the engineering drawings or at least the basic spacing etc so and how this would be done so this this is just a oops that's a I can't do it here, but this is just a slab, of course, but all these beams then are, are complex profiles, which I can literally run across and see in any section I want to see it in, so. Okay, so that's all modeled. And I know your your philosophy is in general to model everything that you're going to see in the drawing. Yeah, I, I don't get it, you know, I don't get carried away. For instance, if I was to look at the Harris um, section, um, those trusses aren't they're just a truss i grab to put in there you know to me that's indicative only you know i don't i don't worry about that's the actual truss at this stage anyways i tend not to do too much in the way of of heavy documentation most of my stuff is just the design work only i'll i'll do some construction drawings but minimal most of my i either work you know with builders or with um owner uh, owner builders uh, or my drawings seem to have been good enough in almost every instance. I don't have to do much more than than what I do. But I don't get carried away with with you know proper junctions in these kind of areas here. If if um, uh, you know the builder doesn't know how to do that, you know. I'm, so I don't. Again, it's it, 
it's 3D as much as I can make it to make it worthwhile. And, and for instance, in here, uh, the slabs are just, a, well, they're composite slab. So they do have, they do have, um, uh, to turn off the true line weight. So you can see that it does have a timber floor. It has a, it has a, uh, uh, you know, a plywood or a, or a chipboard subfloor plus the joists. But if the joists were in fact likely to be running the other way, I generally don't worry about putting those, showing those joists in there generally. But I, there, there are certainly times when I do, I do show the joists running, you know, so you see a cross section of the joists going through depending on the type of joist it is. So that sometimes comes back when I get the engineering drawings and I want to go into construction documentation. I might, I might do it at that stage. Okay, so it's a question about does your engineer work in 3D? No, I have not found anybody yet who who does that. I've, I've asked the questions many times. Um, builders are even reluctant. I mean, I you know, I tell them, look, you've got you've got to get buy yourself an iPad, use BIMX to take onto the site. Don't think that's happening very much yet either. So, which is a real disappointment because obviously everything's at hand. I mean, here in Australia, there's been uh, you know, uh, a lot of the very major firms have gone out and bought themselves a big batch of, of iPads, and that's all they're using, you know, particularly on a large story building. It's fantastic. You don't have to run down to the site office every time you want to check a plan, you know. So, um, but no, I find that, that uh, builders are generally very, very hesitant to do something, you know, they're very conservative. Um, I, I have a, there's a thing here called Mega Anchors, which is like a, a tripod system that you can do yourself. It's uh, you, you, they're just um, galvanized pipes that you have a central post and then you drive these tripods in the ground and then set your, your saddle on top of that. Um, I've used it on a couple of projects, had people use it very quick to use, um, you know, no worrying about waiting for concrete to, to set, et cetera. You can be on site within two days with that foundation method, but hard to convince people they should use that. So oh, wait, this, that sounds in interesting. So you, <clears throat> this is a um, construction uh, methodology, which allows a much faster setting up of the foundation for a project? Absolutely, not, not suitable for everything, but if you have a basically, um, it doesn't have to be a flat site, it can be a sloping site. In fact, on a big sloping site, it can be very advantageous. I suppose the soil conditions have to be correct but generally speaking i've even been told they can be driven into rocks but basically what it is is a is a, a central post with three angled sleeves coming off of that you then insert you you have a central post that you put in and you get level basically with a with a level you then drop in a a, a long piece of of gal pipe take a jackhammer and you jackhammer that into the ground you know all around so you get those three pipes into the ground in a spreaded in a spread motion, and um, and and then and then once they're in place, you then drop in your central post at whatever length you want with a saddle on top, so that you can you know obviously make for timber construction, but so it's a, and and uh, you need to have those. I'm trying to think what the spacing is, but if you look up a thing called Mega Anchor, it's one one word M E G A Anchor dot com or .com to AU, I'm not sure which, uh, you'll be able to see the system. I think it's, I think it's fantastic, very quick. No, no, nothing on site to dig holes and, or piers and stuff. You know, again, obviously it has to be engineered, but a, a really, really interesting system. Okay, interesting. Um, so uh, uh, Raul has some other questions. How long does it take you to have construction docs ready? Um, uh, a month? two months or like me in one week is what he said uh, <laughs> for that side project. <laughs> well, um, obviously it depends. He said it's construction documents. Um, most of the time I have to get a, a specification, but I usually just use a, um, a you know, a standard spec uh, and uh, unless it's, well, I, I probably would hand it off to somebody else that was something very complex. Um, I would do more on the drawings as far as you know, making sure that, for instance, that all the drawings did comply uh, with the engineering drawings, which is a standard thing, anyways. 
Um, so that's when I might put in more details about what the kind of joists and what size and where the beams are and actually show the a steel you know, on the steel beams, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, I would say I could finish that in a week. Yes, there's no question of that. If if I've got the, you know, the time, which I usually do, I tell my clients most of the time I could do a design in a week. You know, get it get it to a DA in a week. If everything just I was not busy with anything else, and if they weren't going away on holidays, but it never works out that way. It's often two or three months at least before the DA is ready because there's all sorts of of toing and froing and waiting for for either waiting for somebody else to answer you. Um, but yeah, so does that answer the question? Uh, I think sufficiently for now. So you mentioned that you're, um, you, you don't pay attention too much to the detailed intersections of things, but you do put in things like the gutters in 3D and, and so. Um, yeah, for instance, I do think about, oh. <laughs> yeah, sure, Rich, okay. Well, normally, um, that should have cut this you know so again mind you this is still at the da stage so if i'm going to construction i would make sure that that wall cuts through this timber floor using the building materials okay making sure i had the the um the um strength of the materials etc that would allow it to do that it would appear that it's down lower than that but i'd have to i'd have to see so so that's the sort of thing i would worry about but you know, window details, that's the standard ARCHICAD. I'm not, I'm, would rarely put in a um, uh, an actual manufacturer's detail on that sort of thing. I just don't go to that kind of, that's not what I do. You know, it's just not. Um, yeah. And your details like at the eve? Sorry? At the eve, um, what would, uh, what do you have? Uh, the eve and the gutter and, you know, stuff like that again not normally i don't show any i well in this case there probably is not going to be a um a uh, soffit but if the soffit was in there yes i would show that but again i don't generally speaking get into any look i suppose it again it depends on the on the client and the type of build um if I thought it was necessary uh, because of of certain aesthetics, et cetera, that I wanted things a particular way, then I would show it. But generally speaking, I don't have that sort of project. Most of the people I come come to me are unfortunately not very well. I think not very imaginative. They they like the sort of almost project home style, as this is a typical example, um, and um, trying to shift them into something a bit more exotic where you might want to have something special uh is very difficult to do so that's just the kind of except, except if you have clients like the indian palace one uh, well that's an exception that's yeah. now huge... by the way you submitted or you sent in to me hey eric i've done some stuff with schedules that i thought people would be interested let's make right. sure that we get to that either now or or soon yeah no happy to do that um yeah, this is how this all started. I was doing a schedule for this particular job and um, thought, oh, uh, look, you know, I, I think this works pretty well for me. I wonder if anybody else does it the same way or whether I can show somebody else. Um, the the um, So what I normally do is I'll just quickly read through this, show the schedule plans in a view map. I, uh, well, let's just do it. Um, so what I do is I set up a schedule folder and in that I have all of my um, let's get this over here so in that I have why are you doing that to me um, I have then three plans I have the upper floor plan all right and all and everything else is basically stripped out except the plumbing um just so that i can show oh, i see what's happening um so that i can show um uh basically just the windows and the window schedules as i like to set them up with those particular uh window markers um so so i have the upper floor ground floor and then in this case because there's a gable wall which isn't normally seen on the plans 
that gable wall i've got windows in you know so you don't see that on the ground floor etc so that's a separate uh, story so then i've separated that and given a plan for that so in the end what i end up with is is then this is my window and door schedule so i show now in australia there well in new south wales there's a thing called basics which is an energy assessment that you must comply with and of course that's getting stricter and stricter and um, so what you have to do is be able to calculate uh, the area of, of glazing that you have in your project so this is just the glazing um, windows and i mean most most windows would be on the on the list anyways but there might be an internal window somewhere in some projects uh, that you have to sort out uh, and then these are the glazed doors so those are the items that i need to to get the information on to be able to then go off to the website and do the basics report itself where i have to go in and enter all this information about the sun orientation what kind of shading devices they have um can, the, you, zoom in on, uh, can you zoom in on one part so we can see sure so in my scheme, which I'll show you in a minute, um, I then set up this, so the height, width. We haven't zoomed in. So you might be zooming in using a keyboard thing on your Mac. You have to zoom in on, on in the ARCHICAD. Uh, oh, sorry, you... yes, of course, yes. Sorry. How's that? Yeah, much better, yeah. Okay, so height, width, head height, sill height. Um, those are the critical ones. It's mainly these two that I use for my schedules, plus I use the nominal surface area the sun orientation and whether it has a shading device or not so how does it know the sun orientation i have to i have to physically enter that into the schedule okay. and is that um is that a, a custom property or is that some other uh listing field no in this case it's a custom one so and this this is the scheme then for uh the windows so all i need to do is say element type is window element id in this case is not eo now the eo is an empty opening for instance you'll see here there is an empty opening right now the reason for that is that's a kitchen window that's a folding uh um, window but there is no window in archicad that suited that purpose so i used a door instead so if i take a look you'll see that's a blank there but if i go to the actual um one here come on whoops it's uh yeah geo6 it's this one here now how did i do that well it's simple i've just overlaid a uh and by the way this i'll show you something else in a second. but that in fact there's the empty opening so i've done this in a door in a special door schedule just that, that window alone or that door alone i've made sure that the listings here were the same and then i've just uh, brought that in over top of the other one and you wouldn't know that there was a change to that now the reason i said something there is interesting if i go back to my window uh listing here i noticed this i'm not sure why it's happened but Here, where are we? Windows. Um, you'll notice that the spacing now, again, it's changed again. I'm not sure why it's doing this, and normally doesn't do it. Um, how wide these are. So this would throw out my um, my. This. Why isn't it updating? Mm. Well, anyways. Um, what you can do by the way if you didn't anybody didn't know this you can go into here i didn't know this for a while and you you can double click and it automatically sizes those minimizes those column width do you want to know how to do it for all of them at once yeah sure would <clears throat> all right in <clears throat> in the upper left corner of that schedule no 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 there click on the three dot symbol and then oh, there's resize, resize columns to fit. Oh, I see. All right. Okay. Yep. That's rows, but then you want to do resize oh, columns. Sorry. sorry. Yes. Can I undo that? Oh, uh, no. No, I can't. No, that you'll have to manually change the the size. 
it doesn't matter. This is it's not that critical. So sorry. So resize I oh, see right. J. It's an interesting thing. I I often find why isn't oh or doesn't I have to excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting. I, I often I have I have done a fair amount of um, private uh, tutorials as well as well as doing a term at the university here, um, and it's interesting. A, a new bod comes along and asks, "Is what's what's that for?" And I say, "Never seen it before," uh, because it's on a dialog box I've been so used to been looking at. I miss I miss stuff uh, quite often, and that's one I should have I should have seen. It's it's pretty obvious. You think how can you miss that? But I have. Um, so, um, yeah. If, if. Okay. So, um, so you you're creating a, uh, certainly a very useful schedule in terms of uh, what it's showing. You mentioned that you have a custom property, so let's just see where the custom property is defined, so that everybody understands where that's done. Custom for the orientation. For the orientation. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. That would be under the options menu, I believe. Well, no, it's a, it's a, it, in the schemes then. So you'll see that the element ID, these are the listings, height, width, head height, sill height, quantity. And then I've obviously done a, a, um, a sum, uh, you know, a, a total of those using the, the symbols in this column here. So it can be a subtotal. It can be nothing at all, a sub, sorry, a subtotal or a total. Um, and then I've used, uh, I believe these would be both um, custom layers. So if I go to add a field, where has that gone to? So it's, it was, it would, it popped up just to the left of your cursor. Um, Maybe something was. Oh, hang on, it's over. Yeah, it's over. What? Oh no, sorry. Hey, sorry. No, where you click on the add fields again. Oh, yeah, up there it is. And then you just would okay. type in so, like orientation. So or something. I'm pretty certain that it would be one. Of, there it is. There's custom one, custom two that's been used. So that's what I've used in these. And then once you've added a custom. So I've just added that custom text there. You can then go in here and when uh, when you when you, when you're in the schedule itself yeah that's that's when you read it. right so so i can say okay to that it, it will add an extra line uh there it is the extra line here at the bottom and then i can go into here and i can change that to and if i go back to my scheme it'll now be testing so uh and of course you can rearrange these and just to show you one other thing for instance if i go to my door list oh sorry uh So this is my interior door list, but I'm trying to find one there. I've sh yeah, um, yeah. So I've named my ground floor doors G and interior doors G I D, as opposed just to G D, which would be an exterior ground door, and a U I D for upper floor U I D. So, so I'm able to say I only want to see doors that's, that they're they're um, Element ID starts with GID or UID. So you can exclude items, you can include items, mm -hmm. but I find that if you're really careful with your with your um, element ID scheduling, that you can, you know, <clears throat> for instance, in here, um, I have. I have quantity takeoffs of all the walls, for instance. 
So I've I've used the the um, ID to to name all the different walls. The, this client wanted to have this. He's he's a developer builder, and uh, <clears throat> so it allows him to do quantity takeoffs for all of his his uh, the different types of walls and finishes, and <coughs> etc. So that yeah. schedule. Uh, So, so Rich, you, um, you you had the empty opening in there for in order to have a space in the schedule for the for the window because it is a window even though it was uh, made with uh, uh, you, you put in a door because the door created something uh, easily um, that you needed to use as a window. Yes. Uh, a few comments there. One is uh, I believe that you can schedule windows and doors together. Um, if you want, if you just change your your criteria for the schedule, and of course you can also then say, well, I only I want windows that are exterior, and I want doors that have a special designation. You know, like this is actually a window, <laughs> right? You know, you you label it W instead of D or something like that, and then you would actually be able to have it integrated in to the um, to the schedule. Right um that might avoid having you know this copy and paste on the on the layout sheet yeah you know fair enough i mean i that because that can go awry at some stage if um if things start shifting which i expect if i go back to this and right now it will have done so um because of our reassignment of nah, it doesn't seem to at the moment so maybe i haven't updated it yet that's the that's the clue um which is interesting this um does everybody know about how to resize um a, a, or get a double row for instance i as i have on this is uh, it's something uh, you which them. you know i think that's uh restructured table is a great thing to know about so i'll just delete that there's that extra window and i'll bring in this window i'll drag it in again so what we have now is a very long you know it's too long for the thing so what I can do is select this, and by the way, you need to have, um, I found that fit the frame, click for this to work, otherwise that option is not available. So you can come into here, you can select this last one here, and then you can resize this however you want for the width, and it'll give you a number of columns. In this case, I know I can't fit that last long window on, so I'll do this. And there we have then the the um, uh, I'll bring uh, I think I've changed like I said I've changed the the size of the or or maybe I've got it as what happened is you you changed the the size of the row oh that's right I changed the height of the row so and anyway. so yeah so so I would need to do the same for this and this is a problem of having this system because I can't now. I don't think that'll match up with the rows, so so it won't doesn't work. But but anyways, yeah, that's, that's that. a simple way of that's a simple way of of um, uh, yeah, that restructured table, which is that option when you have the the schedule selected and you go to one of its corners, and then you instead of stretching the um, well, instead of resizing it to Fit a certain width, which might make it tiny. You're basically saying, just keep stacking, yeah, yeah. a maximum width. And it's interesting you're able to have one that was full length of the row and one that was in the second row just being roughly half, um, because that's all it needed. And then you could fit in the other schedule nearby. So, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very elegant. But do experiment, Rich, um, on uh, creating a schedule that has windows and doors, but then you're very selective only you know the id has to match you know something <clears throat> like you yeah. use the id for the door in a similar you know like a, so a i would need i would need to add uh, another um element like, type you just do type just type in type at the top so it would be it would be door and no 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 um no Okay, so just delete that one or remove that one. Okay, now add add criteria. 
at the very top type in type and this is going to be element type sorry um, the, um did you did you, did you type type or typo i can't tell i said type and you should have element line type window type element type sorry there we are okay and then you can move that up next to the one that says window and make this one say door and you'd want to change it from and like the first two which yes. is it can't be a window and a door so it can be a window or a door and then you're going to say and the element id you know you'd have to be more specific um, element id you know is you know w whatever starts with you can say element id starts oh, yes. with okay. um come on you do double click there you go okay yeah, i do but it's like i said I'm, the last couple of days is the mouse click is funny it's not it's either too fast or too slow i'm trying to set it um so uh, so that if i say it or uh, starts with mm -hmm. um and we might just say it starts with a w or you know whatever but um uh, yes it would be i think an sd or something i don't look i'll have to see i'd have to go and check that um so i'll say okay for the moment we have the element ids just in the um uh well we were seeing them but uh, yes yeah, so let me get that i'll do that um so, um hmm. it won't be oh well i can do it on the plan sorry just a minute Well, you have IDs showing right now in the schedule that hasn't been updated. What are yeah, those IDs? So it, that should be the window schedule that's showing there, not not the door one. So I need to go into the door. So the uh, it's an SP06, so SP, right? Special. Okay. So back to to. scheme setting so and or uh, sp and now you'll need to probably group sorry you'll, you'll need to probably group a quick parenthesis oh there you, okay there you go so you've got So that the, the only, oh, I see. So if I go to, I'll be under S, I suppose, for H. There we go. There it is there. The SP06. So that's a door. The other ones are windows. That's correct. And, but I then would have to go, then for this particular instance, I'd need to go in and, and take out we have to eliminate the uh, the empty opening one. So I'd have to say that this is add criteria, element ID, and say is is not um, does not contain. and does not contain or, or does not well, you, it has to be and but you, you'll need to do parenthesis around the the first two the ors in other words it's um or, well you know you have element id is not this and oh contains no i don't want contains i want to say does not contain does that work um you want to say element ID is not, I mean, you have and, um, well, let's see. <clears throat> All right, so you basically put the two that are. No, that, that's, that's worked. Okay. All right, so you have to play around with it, but just like algebra, you have to decide what things are, are related to what um, ands or ors, you yes. know, 
pluses and multiplies. So, I, in fact, could name this the GW, sorry, I could name, instead of SP, I could have named this the GW06. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. All right. So bottom okay. line is um, uh, here we have an example where you found a workaround. It was working just fine, but it, it was a little bit prone to, hey, if you make a change in the schedule, all of a sudden the the patch that you dropped on had to be coordinated. So that's, you know, preferred if you don't have to do that. Uh, but by using the more the flexibility that recent versions of ArcGIS have introduced into the schedule, where you're saying, hey, I want windows or doors, but they have to meet certain criteria, um, then you can have a schedule that just does it all in one go. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then your total. So you, you're able to put in these numbers in terms of the area. Um, into your energy submission, and uh, yes. and then you just it's up to you to get the the orientation correct. Obviously, that's another you know thing that has to be verified. Um, so this, this this is how it gets entered into the well, not how it gets entered, and this is the final re the certificate that's that's printed. Um, so these are the resulting. Uh, there's the sizes. Uh, I then have to decide on the frame, the you know, aluminium frame type, whether it's a standard, whether it's a, um, um, what do they call it? Anyways, you know, a premium frame, et cetera, what kind of glazing, um, there's the shading devices, the overshadowing, all those things have to be put in. And this is then the final report, which then, uh, provided I've, I've given it the right values, gives me a, an okay on the energy uh, efficiency. So these are all the different, different, um, you know, cooling system, hot water, heating, ventilation. So this is just, just really a copy of the basics um, commitments that the project has to meet. Right. Okay. So you're you're putting that in manually into your own spreadsheet or your own uh, online form, but you're pulling the data from, of course, the model. Um, and, right. Uh, okay. So there was a question. Um, so Gary had a good suggestion saying uh, you just make the ID match your other elements. In other words, instead of having it SP or whatever, you just name it um, the ID just like yes. your other windows um, yes. that you want to include. Um, so even though it's a door, it, it just happens to have um, the right thing. Um, in fact, then you don't have to do, doesn't have empty opening. You just say element ID starts with, you know, whatever. Um, it, yeah. No, I, I could have named it GW06 uh, and had the empty opening as an EO, so that doesn't show up on any schedule. And yes, and it would show up in there with that uh, that situation. Very good. Thank you very much. Different ways to simplify it. Now, Steve Preble says, is there a way to change the scale of the AXO images in the schedule? So if you want to go yeah. back to the schedule, um, and we'll just uh, take a quick look at that control. Um, so. Sorry. So in here, so it, um, actual, and now that's a good question. The actual size. I'll, I'll tell you where to go. Yep. All right. So click on one of the small windows, like the one of the little triangle ones. Okay. All right. Now, if you, when you click on any of these previews, you'll see on the left-hand side, there is a scale number. Right now, it says fixed one, two, 50, I can't quite tell, or one to 100. Yeah, drawing scale. Yeah, so, so 200. So that's right. one way, you know, you're basically saying, hey, for all of these previews, I want it to be such and such. Now put it back to the one to 50 there, or the one to 100, whatever it was. Ooh. Um. Okay, now just um, we're going to take one that's very large, like the one that's next to it that that's the that uh, meets at a sort of a it's higher in the center. Oh right, yes. Okay, now just narrow down <clears throat> that column manually. Just just um, all right. Now what you'll see is it's going to start to truncate or overlap um, in in an odd way. Take it even a little further, just for for now. In other words, just uh, Make it narrower. Now you'd have this in certain cases with a garage door, 
you know, like a garage door can be very much wider than all the other doors. Now, what you do is go ahead and highlight that um, particular window or that particular one. And you'll see that the scale is fixed. Press down on that fixed one and there'll be an option for um, to fit and in that scale. Oh, I see, right, yes. All right, so what'll happen is all of them will basically go maximum that scale, but if, if it's not big enough, it will arbitrarily make it smaller. So you can make it big enough for most of them to be at scale, but, um, but have maybe really large, uh, unusual ones not to scale. Um, so that, that would be the way that you have at least the flexibility that not everything just balloons up or, or is out of control. Um, very you, good. Yeah, you can annotate these things. So I'm not quite sure. I've never done this, but if, if you click on that one that's out of scale right now and you uh, click on annotate, it now allows you to put in some 2D information. So go to the A, you know, the, the text and just put not to scale. Okay. And then just go back to the schedule itself. Whoop. You have to save the changes, yeah, I guess. So now we can see that NTS um, listed there. So basically, you can make sure they're all consistent, except where necessary. And you can annotate it so that it's very clear this is not the scale. Yep. All right. And in case, another thing which I'm sure people know, maybe know, but anybody who doesn't know, you can go here. If you've got a problem with this particular window, you can either one go to click on here and it'll find it in 2D. Don't know quite why it zooms in quite so far, but so that's the window in question. Um, or if we um, click on a window and say, look at it in 3D, then it looks at it in 3D. And you can see it highlighted when when uh, you came out. Yes, oh. yeah. So that's for, I, I find that very handy to try to, you know, you can say, what, what the hell window is that or door, et cetera, particularly for instance, like an interior door, which all look the same. So if you want to find that, um, yeah, okay. What was that about right. See, these, these are interesting things. For instance, I don't know how many, if I've ever, I have, I'm sure, but rarely do I click that button and see what's what's there. Um, yeah. So um, here's a question, John Dunham asks, can you dimension the windows and doors in a 3D AXO? Um, so uh, if you click on one of those, um, any of the windows in there, and then you go to, um, there's dimension settings on the left side, uh, you know, this would be a general one. And let's see, does it say variable? Um, okay, so this has to do with what it's gonna look for in terms of the hole or the unit size, et cetera, there. Um, now, you can see there's a button just above that one that says add automatic dimensions. It's on the left side and it's just above. All right. And there you go. So the answer is Archicad does do a uh, you know, reasonable job there. Um, I believe you can go in and, and click the annotate button and potentially add more annotation or maybe move some of those things around. Like if you wanted, if some of the text was not um, showing in a legible way. Um, And then you, you, instead of resizing all the column, well, you could do resize all rows, but you could, but you. Yes, right. But you could just do the one row. You can double click on the bottom of, of the bottom separator. You can either type in a value here, you know, saying I want this to be bigger. Um, right. Or you can drag drag that thing at the bottom, you know, on the left side where it's the, that one, or you can double click on it if you if you want. Doesn't seem to want to change. Why is that? Here we go. 
Okay. So um, anyway, those are some options. And is yeah. there a way? Of, oh yes. Here we go. I can change the scale here. Can I? Yes, I can. Um, to to make it a little easier to to see the whole row, which of course it's, in this case it's a long one, but. If you really want to see the whole row, there's another one next to the 100%, to, that's the width one. And that basically zooms it to where you can see the full thing. So in this case, it makes it hard to see anything, but you at least can get an overview. Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, Tom Hopkins asked, how would you add a link to a detail in the schedule? There's no way that I know to do that. You can have a text field that you put in text that would be like HTTP, you know, something or another. Uh, that in the Archicad file will not be clickable, but if you create a PDF from it, I believe that that would be clickable. So certainly you can read it, um, you can put it in as a text thing, and then I think in PDF, it, if you have it in the standard format, it may be. Uh, automatically recognized as a link. Um, that would be a way to do it. And of course, that could be a, a property related to the element. In other words, you pick whether it's a window or a piece of equipment or anything else. Uh, you know, that could be using a custom property. So uh, you're not, you, you didn't use custom properties for that orientation um, there. You used custom text one, which as long as you know what you're doing is fine. You can um, do the sun orientation using that. But um, another option would be to use the new uh, custom property that were introduced into maybe ARCAD 19. Um, right. And uh, then you can it's name fun. that property instead of custom this, you can name it sun orientation. And it would actually give me those orientations? No, um, but this is something I actually created a tutorial um, a few weeks ago based on one of our other users who uh, sent me an idea related to quantity takeoffs for based on orientation. Uh, we created a custom property and had it as a pop-up list, you know, north, south, east, west, and you could broaden, you could broaden it to northeast, southeast, you know, et cetera. Um, and then uh, you not only would just show it in the schedule, much like you have here, but uh, we used a custom graphic override to be able to show in a 3D view or on plan color coding. So you could make sure that all the windows are on one, that are on one side actually are set up correctly, that they're all saying that they're east instead of something accidentally getting messed up. Um, so check out the tutorial I created it just um, maybe three weeks ago. Uh, it's about a 15 minute tutorial, I think, um, demonstrating uh, a, a few interacting things that allow you to create a schedule similar to this. We didn't actually have um, uh, previews of, of things, but we did do uh, quantities for doors, windows, and, and actual walls. Do you need to report on the um, uh, areas of the walls in a certain orientation? Um, do I, do, I don't need to re report on them, no, no. Okay, all right, so I guess in some energy um, submissions that's required, and in yours, you just need the openings. Okay. I've never used the energy. I, you know, it's something probably I should look at one of these days. Mind you, it has, it's not acceptable here anyway. So I, one of the reasons why I haven't bothered. Um, um, but yeah, you have to go through this basics or, or other, you know, nathers or other programs to, to get the energy assessment. Right. Okay. I see a comment from Steve that he tried to scale, change the scale of the images in his schedule and it's not sticking. Uh, when he closes a window, it doesn't save the change. So we'd have to look at that, Steve, separately. Um, as far as I know, you make a change in the schedule, um, it should automatically be saved. Like there's no interim thing saying, go ahead and save the changes. In fact, that's why you couldn't undo your change in the, in the, the row sizes because it just instantly takes that data. Um, one of the things I did notice that seemed unusual is that, you know, this might be a good example. Um, it didn't, ooh, it didn't seem to, oh, there we go. There it updated then because I made the change to that. So now we've got the new schedule in, the, in its, you know, full-blown 
scale with and all the, with all of the annotation and things. But, and but before I had that, you know, in the proper area with the, you know, the one and a half sort of row, and it wouldn't update. I actually had to delete it and bring in the new one to get it to, to do the same size. I couldn't get it to, even though it says um, auto, you know, I don't know that was manual. Um, well, it wasn't on auto, was it? No. But I had it on auto in the other one, and I thought, well, it should update because I've updated the schedule, but it wasn't updating. So it was well, unusual. Cancel out of this, and do you, do you know just how to right click and say update? Yeah, I tried that too on, on that one, and it just it didn't it didn't do it. So, anyways, look, that was that's not not really so, um, all right. So we're at an hour and a half. Um, you've shown us quite a bit of the inner workings. Uh, what else haven't we seen in terms of projects? You, I think you had three projects you were going to show, and we've seen a bit. Yeah, let's see two. what else I had here. Uh, we'll schedule extra stories. We've talked about um, so we extra stories for other things, and that I think that was uh, interesting because in addition to um, uh, oh, I know. Okay, I could choose, your special yeah. ones, you also have some extra ones that you use for other things. Show us uh, what you're using stories for. Just trying to see which one might be a good one to explain that. Um, so this is a, a, an ongoing, just it's sort of fairly in the early stages. Uh, and it, uh, there was this expansion up into the roof space. So added dormers, uh, a lift on one side, um, a, a whole downstairs reconfiguration. Um, but so if I go to a this is a remodel, is a remodel project. Yes, yes. So if I go to the, uh, sorry, if I go to the um, site and roof plan. So I'm sure that other people have done this. You've probably covered this before, but just to show you, there is actually, uh, I see th um, three different um, frames there that, that are important. Um, so what we have, if we go through those is, this is the this is the ground floor plan. Just drag it, drag it, drag it off to the side so we can see what moves with it. So that's all the the ground floor paving. Um, of course, you don't see this stuff because it's under the roof, uh, the trees, etc. So that's all part of that ground floor. Um, uh, that's what you're seeing now. In addition to being just the ground floor plan, that should have I'm pretty certain. If you'll notice, I've got here a special pen set. Now I could do this probably with overrides too, which I haven't played around too much with, but this is a simple method. I just set up a, a, a particular pen set that I then use. I just, in the in the view map, that has that pen set. So if I was to look over here, I would see the ground floor background. That has that pen set, which is, these are my pen sets. So there's the CMAC background. So all the pens, ooh, would expect more grays, but all the pens that are important are then a much lighter color. So it throws that you know into the background and such. Um, so there was that one. There was should be another one there. So that's the master bedroom level. So what this will show is. Well, actually, that shows more of the interesting. Um, if I drag it the other way, oh, of course, it leaves the uh, impression there, doesn't it? Why isn't it, why isn't it getting rid of that? Um, you've got a virtual trace on you. It might turn virtual trace off. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, so in actual fact, the ground floor, if I was to go to the ground floor plan, it doesn't have all that lower section in it. So, so this, this then is more of the, what you can see below the roof. And then the roof plan itself is overlaid on top of that. So those other two layers have been using the special pins. Again, you can do that with graphic overrides. Um, and um, this that other one should be showing, which it doesn't 
seem to be. So why is that? So that's the master. Oh, that's the master bedroom. Oh, that's sorry. That's the master bedroom. That's the very lowest floor. That's why the the pool and all those here are on that one. And um, I haven't got an actual fact the upper bedroom one, um, which should then show. I need to have that added in here, which shows the new balcony which comes out into this space here. That's not showing on this. Okay. So you're synthesizing yeah. a top-down view for communication purposes by taking multiple individual views and stacking them um, yes. with certain things that are opaque so that you know the roofs cover up things below um, so because of either limitations in archicad or limitations in the way you're using archicad um, you're not able to get it from one uh one particular view you're taking multiple views and just uh, combining them now one of the things that uh i see that you do not have a uh, any drawing titles associated there you just have a drawing title on the sheet right um, yes yeah so you've just turned off the drawing titles on on those um so there's no title if, if for those of you who would like you know and in certain cases to have the drawing title near the drawing itself rather than in the title block um, then you would just turn off the drawing titles on anything that you don't need and leave it on for the one that has the name that you want um, so uh, anyway, this is a, a you know good sort of example of being creative and saying there's no one view of the plan in ARCHICAD that satisfies exactly what I want to do. So let me overlay two or possibly more than two views to do that. Right. Okay. Excellent. Um, so uh, so Lawrence says not sure why he has layouts overlaid. So these are not layouts. These are um, drawings overlaid on a layout and you know as I indicated briefly it's either due to Archicad's limitations like showing the roof and elements on lower stories that stick out from the roof at the same time you know so basically normally or many elements are only seen in their home story and therefore you know you can't have a view of the roof up above with elements down below that only show on their lower story. Now, sometimes there are ways to do this, but this overlay gives you the total freedom to say, you know what, I'm going to show from the lowest lower story some information and just have it carefully lined up on the sheet. What, uh, what it means is that if I make any change to any of those levels, so if I come in here and I wanted to make a change to the swimming pool, I don't have to go back and worry about a change in the drawing somewhere that will reflect a change in the swimming pool on this drawing right if i change the stair that's coming up the side here that will reflect automatically that's the bim system of saying automatically that changes like i said i haven't shown the balcony in here which i need to add into that uh, like i said this is still early process but but so it so any of these if i was to go to uh Yeah, so these are all live views of the model. They just happen to be different slices that are being stacked for graphic clarity. Um, and if you think about it, uh, Lawrence, or, and all of you who might be thinking, you know, yeah, there's going to be some stuff typically on a site plan that doesn't show up on the third floor, you know, or the, you know, up in upper stories. Um, but you may want to see it on a roof plan or on an overall site plan that's essentially showing what you'd see if you were floating up in space. Um, so stacking multiple drawings together uh, is a way to work around that limitation, and it stays live. You're not copying line work from one place to another. You're exactly. simply showing the active elements in your drawing. So any any change to any of these layers, ground floor, this is just the atrium. Sorry, that was just the atrium roof here by itself, because again to draw that all on one story is well to me doesn't make sense i can you know there's a lot of reasons why i want to separate those because they are basically are sort of a separate construction um i need to see uh if i was to go to my uh 
Oh, atrium walls, for instance. There's the atrium walls. Um, there's the atrium roof separately. Um, and the main roof separately. So any changes I make to any one of those, I can change in the 3D model for whatever reason. And uh, when I go to my site plan the next time, if I made a change, it'll automatically, I don't have to worry about redrawing anything or checking that the 2D has changed. Yes, you're not using 2D. Um, so the, Lawrence says he, it makes sense now, so he you know understands why you're doing it. Uh, he also asks, why do you choose to use preset camera views as opposed to save 3D views? So you have all of these cameras arrayed around, um, and uh, you know you sometimes I've noticed you select them and then go to 3D. Um, but uh, if you ever save them as 3D views, you can just double click in the view map. Well, they are 3D views. I uh, yes, but they still pop up. I don't know unless you can tell me how to get rid of them. I can go to my camera views here. Um, but um, they still come up on the drawing. Then if I go back to 2D, even well, if I turn, let's, let's just do a quick experiment. Go back to 2D, pick pick your um, path that uh, you know that is the one that turns off the cameras. Yes, hang on. You're changing the active path that you're selecting things from, um, and and now the cameras disappear from view, um, and now just double click one of those save 3D views and let's just see if it switches the active path. It may it may do that. That that may be a side effect. So if I go back now to my I, I'd love not to it happen because I like I said, I don't like to see those. Okay. All right. So by clicking on a saved camera view, um, it did activate that path, the path being a, a set of cameras that are you know visible with uh, you know a, a station point and a target point. Now here's something that you might consider. Just go to 3D, um, you know, from that. So just okay. Now just move just a hair, um, in, you know, like with the orbit or even panning. Just a hair. Okay. Good. Now. Go, let's save a new 3D view in the view map. Um, just save current view. Yeah, save current view, yeah. And just call it test or something like that. So I'm not quite sure whether um, when you uh, save it just from the view map, view map whether it's gonna be linked to that camera. It does say that there's a source of the camera, but um, uh, and now turn off, the, let's just turn off the, the path again and then just do that test. This is something I, uh, I know that some 3D views are associated to cameras and others are not. And um, so just go to that test one. Yeah, did it come back? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, that's a, a nuisance. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll want to look into that. Uh, you know, maybe I'm just used to using AXO views so much um, uh, that uh, I don't use perspective as much. Um, that's, that's an interesting you know, talk about AXOs. Once upon a time, you could go into your 3D settings, say, para, you know, uh, and do an axon. And no matter what you, you know, um, you could. For instance, if I was to do a marquee, as an example, this is really annoying. I don't know, the last three or four versions, I'm not sure when it started, but nothing comes up on the screen. Once upon a time, it would always be centered. You didn't have to worry about fit to screen. It would always be centered in the middle of your screen so that you didn't have to worry about, you know, where is it? I found that, right. I find, you know. So you, you just use the keyboard shortcut to fit in a window. I did, yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's something I, I have noticed occasionally, but I haven't really systematically investigated. I'll, I'll check that out. Um, there may be some setting in your, you know, the work environment or how the 3D window is being visualized. Um, you know, but we no point in, in taking the time right now to investigate that. Um, what else do you have to show? Um, 
Oh, by the way, there is another thing Lawrence points out that you can in the camera dialog box. Here's the other thing, actually, probably this is the more direct, you know, foolproof way. Uh, it, when you go to path in that button, in that uh, bottom left of that dialog box, you can say hide cameras. Um, it says camera and path. You see display options, camera and path. Say none. None. And this will just temporarily say, <clears throat> you know what, even when I'm working on this path, <clears throat> I don't want to see the cameras. I don't need to. So now you can go to any 3D view. And uh, do I need to I need to set that probably though on? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're on a different. You're you're able to select. Oh, none. Okay. So it looks to be for set. It has set them for everyone. Okay. So it's a, <clears throat> a state similar to you know you could maybe think of uh, true line weight or not line weight. You know, it just sort of stays that way until you tell it. So if you go to any of those three D views, now you go back to the plan. The uh, cameras. Thank you. Will not Who, be whoever that was, thank you. That's uh, that. Uh, one of your country, one of your countrymen, Lawrence Brill. Oh, thanks, Lawrence. Um, yeah, because that's always bugged me that they keep coming back because it it interferes with fit to screen and a bunch of other things as well. So. I just don't like seeing them. Once I've set them, they're usually set, which is one of the things I was going to discuss. If that's, if um, just a very quick thing, uh, let's go back to Harris, um, and that is how I do my uh, 3D views. So if I go to a 3D, uh, or actually, uh, let's go to the camera uh, external. Whoops. So if I what I maybe you know again this is a particular way that I work I usually set up a four uh, a four perspective views this is mainly as much for the clients but I also submit these to council so they can have a good you know a visual idea of what they're going to be looking at um, and I find even when I'm uh, getting ready to send off another version to the client I might have to go back three or four times I I go to the do the 3D model and say oh shit that window is not the right thing or I've missed the steps or this is not, you know, there's a lot of things that, that you decide you want to correct. You know, you might want to change a color, you might, whatever it is on the 3Ds. So what I do is I say, fine. So I'll go to um, my floor plan. I make sure that usually that's, that's the layer combination that'll work for me. So I'm happy with that. Um, and, and usually doesn't, uh, well, uh, so, what I will do then also say document. I'll go to creative imaging, create fly through. I'll change this to JPEG. I say the 3D window. In this case, I could go to photo rendering, but I don't do that very often. Keyframes only. I've only got I've got five, I think, cameras. And I will then say save. Now I will then go and find my my uh, well, yes, documents. We're still getting used to this PC. And uh, where are we? I should have made a change to the model so you could see this more carefully, but or more readily. But um, so you can see how many times I've done renders for this project. There's there's quite a few. Um, so I'll make a new folder. I'll name that folder. And it's the 18th today. So I'll say 18. 0920 in our dating system. And it um, doesn't matter whether I've got that correct or not. But what I'll do here is I'll name this just simply view. Because the, what that will do then is create those views. So if I go to now to my projects, Harris, and I go to in here, what I get is view one, view two, view three, you know, et cetera. Now, what that means is that all of, my, all of my folders are named the same. So what I can do is go back to that latest one, which is 18th, and I can go to my model here, and I can go to my exterior perspective views. And like I said, it's unfortunate that I, I should have changed the model so you can see uh, that what will happen. But I can go to my drawing manager. Those are the four views that are on that page, plus view one up here. So I'll select 
the view one is the cover uh, page image. So I'll select that one as well. And I will now go and say, now go to the new folder, which I'll find here under renders 18. And I'll say, okay. That will now substitute those same, um, and I'll update those. That'll substitute those same uh, images and they'll automatically be sized correctly. So I don't have to do anything more than just that after I've made a modification. In other words, if I went in and deleted this balcony, I can show you by going through that process again, they'll all come back in same size. Uh, so so doing okay. the check. Let me, let me just summarize for anyone who might be a little confused. Basically, in order to update these views, um, Rich is uh, essentially saving them as uh, views in the view map that um, are then placed and cropped um, on, on the sheet. Uh, these views are, are being placed from JPEG, so ex, uh, exports of screen captures, essentially, um, uh, of them. And he's then going and saying, can you just help me, Arcad? can you just export current versions of these views into this folder? Now, you could have chosen the same folder as they were originally, and then it would overwrite them. By doing it in a different folder, you now have a record. You can say, oh, well, three days ago, this is what it looked like, or three weeks ago, or, or um, earlier. Um, so that's all, uh, it gives you the record. That's a really nice uh, workflow to just quickly update through the create a fly through, create, basically do a number of views all in quick succession. And then this read or relink these views from a single folder. So basically saying, you know what, those views that have these names, look in this other folder and uh, you should find all or most of them in that folder and uh, use that. Um, so the. I, uh, yeah, what Erica said there is fairly important to me. For instance, here are all the saved PDFs I've sent to client. So I have a record of all that. If there was ever any argument that, you know, came up that saying, no, I didn't tell you to do that. I can go back at any stage and say, well, this is what you were sent, um, which is one thing you have to be careful about. I'm not sure about on the PC, but certainly on the Mac, if you save a, view, a, a PDF and don't rename it in some way, it'll overwrite the previously named, same named item, and you'll lose that record. So if I make a, even if I'm doing another one today and I've named it the, well, let's say it's the 16th today, I'll put a B in, in behind that, that one because I've made a revision halfway through the day, I might have a B and a C, not very likely, but that sometimes is what happens. I mean, often if it's the same date, you know, it may be the type of thing where I'm saying, I see the mistake and I'll make a correction. But if a client has phoned me up and said, Rich, can you change this? Then I'll definitely want to have another record of what it was before and what it was after. So the same thing goes for the renders. I have all these different renders that, that will be different in some way. Um, uh, I'm sure that if I went in to look at some of these, uh, well, for instance, that's got no lining to the, to the, um, and there'll be windows and things that other things that are different. I'd have to look at the, the dates. Anyways, that's the reason I do it. I like to have a, a record of all the different um, iterations yeah. of projects. Yeah, it's a nice way to do it. I mean, you can place views directly onto the sheet as opposed to placing JPEGs. And then it'll update automatically when you just say update all views, just like updating an elevation or a section. <laughs> But this this way you do have a record copy of um, you know some key viewpoints uh, in your folder. Um, by the way, you'll notice that these have been reduced. For instance, I said it comes in at the same size. These have been reduced. Most of them are probably at 32%. Um, uh, so it's a I like to get a, a very large image in case I want to send. Uh, well, use it later for for promotional purposes or or uh, you know send. A, a, I might have one, I might sometimes I have one image per sheet, depending on how I'm feeling and how, you know, how generous I want to be with the, with the printing. Although obviously these days we don't print anymore, it seems, which is good. Um, but, but those, so those have been reduced. So both in size and in cropping, of course, this is not the natural crop. 
this this image is is normally I'm not sure exactly where the edge of it is, but it's not you know that I've cropped it to these sizes, um, for instance. Uh, so you know there that's that's why this method that I use I think is is good is that you can you can um, have everything come back without having to do any further adjustments. They're always the same. Right. But well, it's only <clears throat> important if you want to have that record. Yeah, if, if you do it as views instead of JPEGs, you can have all of the same benefit um, of in terms of it will just fit into the same crop. It'll fit in with the same percentage, but you won't have a record in an external place of of the views from that particular date. Of course, you know, you can have a PDF of the whole thing. Um, so uh, anyway, um, anything else? So we're you know at the two-hour mark, and we easily filled it just by asking you lots of questions and make, making you. Uh, would you like to? Um, you mentioned you want to have you want to have a quick peek at uh, Twin Motion. Sure, sure. Um, so that is that on your? Is that's on this computer, right? That's on this computer. Yeah. Uh, just just to show, by the way, for people who are technically minded, I've got four versions of ArchiCAD open um plus you know a few other things just to show you that there's the memory that's being chopped up once i go into twin motion uh, it gets pretty full um there's there's the bar down here which shows i've got uh 12 um 12 gigs free so but if i go into uh twin motion i'll just hide this hang on Whoops. I, I'll no, actually I'll leave that open. Cancel. Um, where are we? Which one are we at? Crowdus Bay and Harris and Rhodes. And we'll go to Um. Hmm. Oh, what am I doing? Don't want that. Um, sorry. I do see something that says twin motion file. Uh, oh, in, yeah, no, no, no. Look, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not, brain's not in gear here. Yeah, I know you, you had to start at six in the morning and it's now eight for you. So you've been a, a real trooper. Thank you so much, Rich. I appreciate it. And I think we all do. Um, okay, so now. We're, 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 we're. On the left well, side, you have plan model, and then below that, you have twin motion file. You know, on the left side, it's highlighted plan model is the folder you're in, and two below that is twin motion file. Is that where that would be? So, so again, you may be less familiar with twin yeah. motion. Twin motion chomps up a fair amount of memory. It'll take up most of this. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are maybe less up to date with things, um, Twin Motion is a great visualization tool that uh, was uh, two or three thousand dollars, and it's bought by another company called Epic um, Games, and uh, they then lowered the price to like five hundred dollars. Um, and they've also made arrangements with Graphisoft so that people who are on current Archicad subscriptions and get a free license of it. Um, it's it very high quality visualization directly from your ArcCAD model. And then you can actually go in and add lighting, and, um, furniture, people, you know, other entourage, um, et cetera. So um, it uh, is a fantastic resource for ArcCAD users. Um, so we'll see. Now, I, I've got into this, you know, fairly, enthusiastically about three weeks ago or maybe it's even more more than that but um 
uh, and this was a file I created. I mean, I've, I've done a few other ones, but this is a file I created mainly as a demo for showing to prospective clients. So what they are is there are three different projects. They're actual projects that I've done that work pretty well by flipping, you know, by mirroring them, et cetera, to get them on basically on the same kind of um, um, terrain model that worked well. So, so just to go and show you that these are the sort of things that you can do um, that in a model that makes it a, a lot more realistic, um, you know, people chatting, probably one of my more favorite views, host party. Um, so this, is, this is actually one of your projects. The, this, the building that we're in, yes, would be, is one of my projects. And the building's the other side, because one of the things that often happens, you know, you, you, you want to show up a building, it's pretty difficult to show it in the actual context of the buildings next to it. So I didn't want to just show a, a model in isolation. So I decided I'd, I'd throw in these other two um, uh, dwellings uh, along either side. So, so these are, no, actually two of these are on the Catherine Hill Bay precinct, but this is a separate one. But so they're all, they're all definitely uh, different. Um, I'll just, um, it's uh, interesting uh, my navigation. How all, uh, interesting how all those cars go into that one garage. <laughs> well, you have to show them going by, and uh, you know there's, uh, and I've tried to uh, get it. You know, so the idea when we do a, when I end up doing a a um, quick time VR is that you won't be showing this going all the time. It'll just be snippets. You know, you'll be inside here watching a car go by occasionally, and I'll, you know, you'll be able to, I'll be able to cut and splice you know for instance this one here cars coming down the hill for instance you know i'll be able to cut and splice where i want to so i don't see too many cars driving by all the time right. um but uh yeah so now like i said i haven't done a, a a video of this yet and i've still got a bit more to do to to get it into some sort of uh, reasonable um uh, you know situation to to do that but just to give people some idea of what what's possible you know people away there doing taking pictures and uh, all this background i need to work on etc but yeah yeah no, it's fantastic i i wish we had more time to explore the twin motion side of things but um you know this is definitely illustrating how dramatic the difference is between an archicad view of your architectural model and even if you do put in some furniture some people etc it's nowhere near as lifelike you know yeah these are computer people they're computer game people but they there's just something that that's very tangible you know about this so it's uh, it's very easy lighting, only, sorry and the lighting all the, as well. all the photographs are so quick and easy to put on the wall of you know all the little bits and pieces you can do chairs the all, all, very quick to put in. If I decide I want to change something about the Archicad model, I just go back to Archicad, make that change. I then click on, um, for instance, uh, up here is the, I have to have a 3D image up. Um, and I just say, um, click on that and I can get a direct link and it'll automatically change the model without re destroying anything about the people or the pictures on the wall or the furniture I've added into. So it's a it's a pretty magical way of working uh, of uh, Archicad and then going into this to um, to to enliven the whole scene. You know, uh, it's Cine Render is very slow um, in comparison and a lot more work trying to get up an interior of a house particularly looking good. This is extremely quick. Right. So Steve uh, Pribble says that's a great idea to use old projects to create site context. So you're you're um, really, you know, it's all your IP, it's all your designs. Um, and in fact, um, instead of flipping through a book of renderings, you know, well, let, let's go over to this project. Yeah, so it's in another part of town, but I put it next to this one. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, obviously I'm not very good at navigating um, in this, but like I said, basically these are, I could, I could explore all of these internally, et cetera, if I so wished. Um, and, um, 
it's it's a pretty um and uh, one thing, uh, Chris Iliff uh, says that in Twin Motion they have a new feature introduced into the latest version where doors can open automatically as you approach them if, if you set that up, if you just you know tell it. Um, so you know that's sort of a cool thing. If you haven't played around with that, Rich, you should check that out. Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't had a chance. I've been pretty busy lately with some projects, so I haven't had a chance to play at all lately, unfortunately. I don't know where some people that you know find all this time. They must have longer days than I have. <laughs> all right. Well, um, you've been fantastic sharing uh, everything and being playing along with you know me saying, hey, try this, you know, change that. Um, uh, hopefully, you can retain um, you know a few of the things as uh, ideas to to check out. Um, and absolutely, Rich, if you want some clarification on anything, you know, just let me know. We can have a, a little private session. Thank you. Um, yep. So for any of you who want to learn how to use Twin Motion, like uh, what Rich is doing, uh, there's a course VR for Architects. If you go to vr4architects.com, that's vrfor architects.com, you'll see information about it. I produce that along. Uh, Peter Chu is the teacher, but I produce that, um, and uh, it's still available. You can join in that uh, and learn how to do that sexy stuff there. Um, and uh, for all of you around the world who joined us today, we, we have 79 people still here. I know we were up at 130 or more um, at different points. Um, so thank you for joining us. And if you have any suggestions for anyone you'd like to see present, or if any of you want to volunteer to be given the, the royal treatment and be grilled within an inch of your life here. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I, I Try to be merciful, but also try to say, you know, here's an opportunity for doing things in a slightly different way. So I uh, welcome suggestions or like Rich saying, hey, I could show for something for 15 minutes and uh-uh. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, Rich, you've been a great sport. Um, for those of you who are in the Arcad coaching program, um, we'll start in about 10 minutes. Um, so we'll take just a little break between these, and uh, I'll see some of you there. For those of you who don't know, that's part of my training courses. It is a way for you to get my personal help on your projects. Uh, we have weekly meetings, and uh, you know, I also do email support. So uh, you can email me for information if you want. All right. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. All right. Take have care. Good day. All right. Thanks good night. For, thanks for being an Archicad user. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Right. By the way, a lot of thank yous coming in from Tom and Don and Raul and Steve and Valero and Lawrence. A lot of people thanking you, Rich. So thank you. All right. No. Hope I hope I've been have been some help. Yes, you yeah. have. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.